Well, please open your Bible with me at Psalm 23. We're looking together at this best known and best loved of all the Psalms, and we're doing this in order to find fresh strength and fresh encouragement for these difficult and these dangerous days. The first thing to say about this psalm, of course, is that it's all about the Lord. Every line of the psalm is about who he is and about what he does. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness. But then as we saw last time, this psalm is also all about us. The Lord is my shepherd and every line is about us and about all that is ours when we belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now, we saw last time that the relationship between the good shepherd and his sheep is first and foremost one of ownership. The shepherd owns the flock. And so when I say, the Lord is my shepherd, when you say that, what we are saying together is that the Lord owns me, the Lord owns us, he is our shepherd. We saw that a shepherd takes ownership of the sheep uh, when he buys them and when he births them. And both of these things are wonderfully true of every Christian believer. You are not your own. You have been bought with a price. And not only have you been bought through the shedding of the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've been born. You've been born again through the living and enduring word of God of God. So when we are in the flock of God, because we are bought and because we are born, the shepherd owns us. Now here's the question. What will the shepherd do for the flock that he owns? And this psalm gives five marvelous answers to that question. When you are one of Christ's sheep, He will lead you, he will restore you, he will protect you, he will feed you, and he will love you forever and forever. And today we're going to look at the first of these great works that the shepherd does for the sheep. The shepherd will lead you. Now notice what David says here in verses two and three. He, the shepherd, makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now notice that the first blessing of being wholly owned by the good shepherd is that he leads me. David says this not once but twice. He leads me beside the still waters and he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And David states this simply as a fact. Nothing that you need to do in order to bring this about. It's simply a fact if you're in the flock of God, the shepherd leads you. This is what he does for his sheep. As Paul puts it in the New Testament, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Now, we're going to look today at where the shepherd leads us. We're going to see he leads us in two particular directions. He leads us into rest, and he leads us into righteousness. And then we're going to look at why he leads us. Why does he do it? He leads us for his name's sake. Now let's begin here then. The good shepherd leads us into rest. Verse two, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Now green pastures obviously provide grazing for the sheep. But the main point here is not the feeding of the sheep, but the resting 
of the sheep. He makes me lie down in the green pastures. We're going to look later in the psalm at how the shepherd wonderfully feeds the sheep. We'll come to that when we come to the image of the table and of the cup. But here, lying down, the main theme is of rest. And David uh, expands on it and uh, extends the picture. He says, he leads me beside still waters. Now, sheep are scared of moving water. Of course, if sheep were to fall into moving water, I mean, their fleece would soak up water like a sponge, and the sheer weight of the water would cause them to drown. So the good shepherd, knowing the fear that the sheep have of water, will, will dam up the stream so that there are pools of still water uh, so that the sheep are able to drink. And so what you have here are two beautiful, beautiful pictures of rest. You've got the meadow with lush grass where the sheep can lie down, and you have the pools of still water that are there on the side. Now let's home in on this subject of rest that is so important in the Christian life. And I want to make three observations about it. First, rest does not come easily or naturally to sheep. Notice what he says here, he makes me lie down. Rest does not come easily or naturally to sheep. Now just think about this very powerful image that God gives to us through the pen of David here. Why is it so difficult for sheep to rest? Well, very obviously, sheep are timid creatures. How do sheep defend themselves? They only have one means of defense, and that is to run. And so they remain standing. And the first sign of any threat, you know, the bark of a dog or whatever, and off they're going running in any direction. How can sheep lie down when they are so vulnerable and their only defense is to run away? Well, let's bring this home. Maybe you find it hard to rest. And the reason you find it hard to rest is that there is a big problem that you need to solve. There is a huge challenge that you are confronted with. You're battling many, many fears. And so here's what happens for you. Your mind will not rest. You keep saying, how am I going to get through this? You lie awake at night. You go over all that has happened, and your mind just turns over again and again all that could happen. You need rest, but you don't know how to find it. Well, do you see that David has been there? It's very clear from the psalm that rest did not come easily or naturally to him. He makes me lie down, David says. And of course, when you think about the life of David, it's hardly surprising that he didn't find rest coming to him easily. Think about all these years when he was hounded by King Saul and running for his life. Think about the years of worry that he had over his divided and sometimes dysfunctional family. Yes, the Bible speaks into all of these things. The sheer weight of responsibility that was on David as the king responsible for the very people of God. No, rest did not come easily or naturally to David. And that's why he says, the Lord who is my shepherd makes me. He makes me lie down. Now how? How's that going to happen? Well, think about this. Sheep rest when they can see their shepherd. Sheep will only lie down when they feel safe, and the only way that sheep, timid as they are, are ever going to feel safe is if they can see their shepherd. Now, you try and put yourself in the position of a sheep. You know that you are vulnerable. You know that your only defense is to be able to run. So for that reason, you stay on your feet. 
But you see, when you can see your shepherd, then you're going to be able to lie down and rest. You say, well, what if the coyote comes? Well, if you can see your shepherd, you know that your shepherd will deal with the coyote so you can rest. If the shepherd was to leave the field, that would be a different matter. Then you would be on your feet, constantly looking around, watching for danger, ready to run. But as long as you can see your shepherd, you will be able to rest. And David says, my shepherd makes me lie down. And here's how. He says it quite specifically in verse 4. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. You see what he's saying? Even if the worst happens, even if I go through the valley of the shadow of death itself, I still have nothing to fear because my shepherd is with me. And when I know that my shepherd is with me, then and only then, I can rest. Rest doesn't come easily or naturally to sheep. Sheep can only rest when they can see their shepherd. Now, do you see what this is teaching us? It's very practical. The way, therefore, to find rest is for us to keep the shepherd in view. Think about it. The shepherd does not give the sheep rest by ridding the world of danger. The wolves are still out there, but the sheep lie down, not because there's no danger, but because they have their shepherd in view, and it's his presence that gives them rest. So here's how you address your fears. You call this wonderful truth to mind, the Lord is my shepherd. That means that I am not alone. My shepherd is with me, and my shepherd is the Lord God Almighty. The way to find rest is to keep the shepherd in view. And that is why very wonderfully David can say in another psalm, in peace I will both lie down and sleep, for, here's why, you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. He makes me lie down. Now, here's the first wonderful statement then. When you belong to the good shepherd, he will lead you into rest. And then David says something else that's very wonderful here, that the good shepherd will also lead us into righteousness. He leads me, David says, in paths of righteousness. Now, notice the two uh, ways in which the shepherd leads us. He leads us beside the still waters, and then David says he leads us in the paths of righteousness. So here's a description of the Christian life. There are times of lying down, and there are times of moving forward. Uh, there's more to the Christian life than rest. We rest in order that we may find the strength to follow our shepherd in right paths. Now think about the order. I mean, you would think that it would be the other way around. You would think it was, you know, walk the right path and then you'll be able to rest in the meadow. But notice here, it's the other way around. You rest in the meadow and then you will be able to walk in the right path. That's the pattern of the gospel. It's the rest that Christ gives us that leads to the pursuit of the righteousness to which he calls us. Now, the Bible speaks about righteousness in two ways. There is a righteousness that Christ gives us, 
and there is a righteousness to which he calls us. Paul speaks about the righteousness that Christ gives us in Philippians chapter three and in verse nine. He says this, not, he wants to be found in Christ, he says. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Now you see, he's reminding us of this wonderful truth. We become right with God by the righteousness that Jesus Christ gives us. He lived the perfect life of righteousness for us, and when he died on the cross, that life was offered on our behalf. All the righteousness you will ever need before God is given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ when you become his and he becomes yours. And it is a marvelous thing, and we'll keep coming back to this, to be wholly owned by the Son of God because when he owns you, his righteousness is yours. And this is why you can rest. Because being given the perfect righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ, you can know for certain that there is therefore now no condemnation for you. You're in Christ Jesus. You have peace with God because the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ has been given to you. And that's why Paul says, that's what I want. I want to be found in Christ. That's what matters, to be in Christ because then I have the righteousness that is from God and is received by faith. But the Bible also speaks about a righteousness to which Christ calls us. For example, in 1 Peter, in chapter two, that speaks very wonderfully about why Jesus died on the cross. What was the kind of life he wanted to bring us into? Well, it says this, he, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree. Why? So that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. There are right paths that your shepherd calls you to pursue. And when the Lord is your shepherd, he will lead you on them. And very clearly, this is what David is speaking about here. Paths of righteousness, very simply, are right paths. And where the shepherd leads you, and he will always lead you, uh, now that you are part of his flock, where the shepherd leads you will always be the right path. Now let me make one or two observations on this. First, remember that the right path will not always be an easy path. I mean, verse five, the right path takes you through the presence of enemies. So the Christian life is not always the scene of tranquility that's in verse two. Verse four, the right path takes you through the valley of the shadow of death. But even there, the good shepherd will be with you and he will lead you. So understand this, even in this most beautiful psalm, it's very clear that in the Christian life, the pastures will not always be green and the waters will not always be still. Remember the Gospels record that Jesus said to the disciples, let us go over the other side of the lake. And obedience to Jesus led them into not still waters, but into a storm. But here's the thing. It was in the storm that they saw more of his glory and that they learned just how much they could really trust him. So the good shepherd will not always lead you beside still water. Sometimes he may lead you through waters that are very deep indeed. 
There's a wonderful statement about this in another psalm, Psalm 77. Speaking of the time when God brought his people through the waters of the Red Sea. And it says this, your way was through the sea. Your way, your path was through the great waters, yet your footprints were unseen. You led, notice that theme of God leading, you led your people like a flock, and you did it by the hand of Moses and by Aaron. Now, notice what this remarkable verse is saying about the way in which God leads his people, uh, which is what we're looking at today. There will be times where the way that God leads you seems impossible. When God's people came to the Red Sea, it seemed that there was absolutely no way forward for them. But God made a way through the sea. And God says, when you pass through the waters, and you will sometimes pass through deep waters, God says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And notice from this verse that there will be times when you find it hard to detect the presence of God. Yes, the shepherd will always be with you. But there were times in the experience of God's people where they could not feel or discern his presence. Notice what it says here, your footprints were unseen. And there will be times in your life where you may come to a place of saying, now where is God in this? I can't see him, I can't feel his presence, I cannot figure out what he's doing. God's ways will sometimes be a mystery to you. But you can be sure of this, that when the Lord is your shepherd, he will lead you. And even when his footprints are unseen, the way in which he leads you will be the right path. And then notice this. There will be times when God's direction in your life comes to you through people that he puts beside you. Do you notice in this remarkable statement of how God leads that the psalmist said, you led your people like a flock. How? By the hand of Moses and Aaron. Now, do you see why that is such an important statement? Seek wisdom and counsel from godly people God puts around you when you are trying to discern the right path. This is one of the ways in which he will lead you. You are not on your own. God gives to you under shepherds, under shepherds of the flock. You are not the only sheep. You, are, you have others who God has placed around you, and they will play a part in the gracious way in which God grants you discernment and in which he leads you. Now, we're looking then at this remarkable truth. God leads his people. He leads us into rest, and he leads us into righteousness. We've seen that as he leads us on the right path, that the right path will not always be easy. But here's what I want us to take in now, and it's really wonderful. Where the shepherd leads is always the right path. It is always the right path. He leads me in paths of righteousness. Now, this is very practical. And it speaks to situations where we may struggle in our lives with change. See, there will come times in your life where you say, now why does the shepherd need to lead me somewhere else? Why can't I simply stay where I am? I've been happy here. I don't want things to change. Why does the shepherd have to lead us somewhere else? Well, I want you to think about this. It's embedded in this beautiful analogy 
that God gives to us here in the Scripture. Think about the work of a shepherd. A shepherd has two responsibilities. He has to care for the sheep, and he has to care for the land. And when sheep are put into a uh, green field, they have a feast. I mean, it is just marvelous for them. The problem is that the sheep don't know when to stop. And if sheep are left in a green field for too long, guess what will happen? They will eat not only the grass, they will eat the very roots themselves, and they'll leave the whole place absolutely barren. So a good shepherd has to have a land management plan. And before the field gets to the place where the sheep have overgrazed it, he will move the sheep on. And he moves them on so that he can sustain their nourishment in another place. Now, I'm suggesting that knowing this will really help you when you struggle with something that is changing in your own life. See, God has put you in a place where the grass was green. You've been happy in that field. And now the shepherd is moving you on. Things have changed. And you don't want to move on. You say, I don't want change. Uh, why can't I stay where I was? Why can't things be as they were? I don't want to leave this field but follow what is being taught to us here in this analogy of the shepherd and the sheep. When the shepherd moves you on, he's saying to you, yes, this is a place where you have been fed and nourished, but it is no longer the place where that will happen for you. I have another place, and there I will provide for you. There I will feed you, there I will make you lie down. Do not be afraid. This is the right path. Now, you may not want to move into the new field to which the shepherd leads you, but he will feed you there. He will feed you in a way that your soul would not have been fed if you had stayed where you were before. So trust the shepherd whenever he moves you on. You know, there's an old hymn that has this line in it. I've often found it helpful. In heavenly love abiding, no change my heart will fear. And I want to say to the person who is afraid of change, afraid of a new chapter of life, afraid of a new situation. You say, how is this going to work out for me? When the Lord is your shepherd, you do not need to fear change because where the shepherd leads you is always the right path. Now, we've looked at the shepherd leading us, leading us into rest, and leading us into righteousness. There's one more thing I want us to see here today, and it's very wonderful, we mustn't miss it. The good shepherd leads us, why? For his name's sake. He leads me in paths of righteousness, David says, for his name's sake. Now, it would be really easy just to pass over a little phrase like this at the end of these wonderful verses that we've been looking at, but what I want us to see today is that these words are the most wonderful of all. See, here's the question. How can I be sure that the shepherd will lead me? What assurance can I have that he won't lose me along the way, and that I will finally arrive in heaven, that he will lead me safely home. 
And maybe you find yourself sometimes coming to a dark valley. And you know what it is to say to yourself, sometimes I feel like giving up on myself. How do I know that God in the end will not give up on me? Now, the answer to that question, whenever you face it, lies in these wonderful words, for his name's sake. Why does the shepherd buy you and birth you into the flock? The Bible's answer is that God does this for his own name's sake. Let me give you just a couple of examples. I mean, this is all over the Scripture, so I'll just limit myself to two. Ezekiel chapter 36, therefore say to the house of Israel, say this to God's people, thus says the Lord's God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I am about to act, but for the sake of my holy name. And then God says, which you've profaned. It's not that you've earned this. He's going to go on and speak about the gift of cleansing and of the new heart. And why is God going to give all of this? Why does God remain faithful to his people where we are disappointing even to ourselves in so many ways? The answer is he's faithful to his people for his own name's sake. Or Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 25, look at this. I am he who blots out your transgressions. Why? For my own sake. Do you know, early in his life, the apostle Paul was really among the worst of men. I mean, he tells us very honestly that he was a blasphemer and a violent man. And then he says this, I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, that means the worst of sinners, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. You see what he's saying? Paul says, God picked one of the worst people in the world in order to show how patient he is. God did not choose me, Paul is saying, because he saw something lovable in me. No, I was a blasphemer and a violent man. Now, I can imagine someone at this point saying, well, now, wait a minute, I I don't really like this. I like to think that when God looks at me, he sees something beautiful. I like to think that he's drawn to me because of what he sees in me. That he loves me because he finds something that is lovable in me. And here's the problem. Where would that leave you when you are no longer beautiful? What would become of you then when you are no longer attractive but ugly? What would be the end for you with your persistent and tiresome waywardness that makes you far from lovable so many times? See, the good news is this. God does not lead you for your sake. God leads you for his name's sake. In other words, the good shepherd has actually staked the honor and the reputation of his own name on leading you safely home. He has said, my sheep will never perish. He has said that he will lose none of them. Not a single one who has put his or her trust in Jesus Christ will ever ultimately be lost. What God is doing in your life, brother, sister, is for his name's sake. His grace, his patience, his faithfulness will be put on display forever through what he has made of you. 
And this is why he will never give up on you. This is why he can never give up on you. No angel in heaven will ever be able to say about one of Christ's sheep, oh, what a shame that that sheep was so weak they didn't actually make it in the end. No angel will ever say in heaven, oh, what a pity that that sheep wandered off and somehow never managed to come back. No, God has given his word. His name is staked upon it. Every sheep that is bought by the Lord Jesus Christ and born into the flock of God will be brought safely home. Not one of them will be missing. And what he has accomplished in each and every one of us, brother, sister, will be for the praise of his glory forever and forever. The greatest assurance that you can ever have is that the good shepherd has staked the honor of his own name on leading you all the way home. Despite your many sins, despite your evident lack of progress, despite your many wanderings, despite the many enemies that assail you and the many doubts that assault you, you will arrive safely home and the honor of the shepherd's name hangs upon it. Do you see what a mar- why it is such a marvelous thing to be able to say the Lord is my shepherd? To know that you are wholly owned by the Son of God, that he's staked his name and reputation on bringing you home, you're his? And because you're his, he leads you. And he always will. And when you arrive in his presence, safe from all of your enemies and with that dark valley of death behind you, he'll still be your shepherd and he will lead you forever. As John says in the book of Revelation, the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will lead them, lead them into springs of living water. For all eternity, he will lead you as your shepherd. You're his. And God will wipe away every tear from your eyes. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to be able to say today, the Lord is my shepherd. Thank you that you lead us into rest and into righteousness and that our great security is that you do it for your own name's sake. And so we give you our thanks and praise through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.